guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where this week I'm going to be covering a potentially legally solved case and one that was absolutely massive. I think I might be a little bit crazy for wanting to dive into this one. It's the OJ Simpson case of recent years. And this is going to be the first ever South African case I've covered and we're talking about the murder of Reva Steenkamp by her boyfriend at the time, Oscar Pistorius and all of the debate that comes along with this. I wasn't sure how well this case was known around the world so I actually asked on Instagram and the answers came back as a little bit of a mixed bag. For the most part it seems like this case was really a global worldwide case. In the UK it was absolutely massive as I'm sure it was as well in South Africa. The likelihood is that you have heard the name Oscar Pistorius before and you have heard the story that comes along with it. In the UK it was so big that I have really vivid memories of sitting in the office with my auntie at work and she would put up the trial on her phone and we would literally watch this live trial go on as we did our work for the day. I remember watching this live as the verdict came in so I can't believe it's taken me so long to cover it. It's just a little bit of a controversial one I think. Let's start as always with a little bit of background information here. Oswald Sorius was born in November 1986 in Johannesburg, South Africa and he grew up with an older brother and a younger sister. And Oscar was born with a disability. He was born with something called fibula hemimelia in both legs which in his case was the congenital absence of the fibula. He had no fibula bone. So his parents had a big decision to make. Either Oscar was gonna to have to spend his entire life in a wheelchair unable to walk, or they were given the option to have his legs below the knee amputated. And that's what they decided to do when he was just 11 months old. He had both of his legs amputated between the knee and the ankle. For most people growing up, this would probably mean that sports wouldn't be your first option when it comes to a hobby. You're already at a quite an obvious disadvantage, even if you do have prosthetics. But Oscar excelled in sports, particularly rugby and water polo. And when he left school, he actually intended to go on to have a career in rugby until a knee injury put an end to his dreams. Alongside rugby and water polo, he also played tennis, he wrestled, and people would note that he excelled in every single sport that he excelled in. He was just an incredible sportsman, and nobody paid any attention to the fact that he was actually an amputee and he did have prosthetic legs. It just wasn't a setback for him at all. Oscar always attributed his mother to his success. He always said that she had never let him see himself really as disabled. She told him from a very young age that he could do literally everything that everyone else could do. And he could, and he did. He never once felt like he was at a disadvantage with his disability because of this upbringing. But really sadly, his mother actually died when he was just 15 years old. Shortly after this, he suffers his knee injury, which puts an end to his rugby dreams. And it's actually during rehabilitation, during or his physio that he's introduced to running and from this point onwards his entire life is about running he never looks back he quickly gets his first running blade special prosthetics for running and they have to be specially made his first set by a local engineer due to a lack of suitable running blades in pretoria which is where he now lived and he eventually gets j-shaped carbon fiber prosthetics called Flexfoot Cheetah, which was the best that you could buy. He starts running in November 2003 as part of his rehab program at the Sports Science Institute at the University of Pretoria. And by September 2004, so not even a year after he first started running, he is competing in the Athens Paralympics. He runs and wins the gold medal in the 200 meter race. And he then wins the bronze medal in the 100 meter race. He took part in the T44 class, which was actually for single below the knee amputees, even though he was actually classified as T43, which is double below the knee amputees. And he was just winning. He was doing really, really well in everything. Not only did he win the gold medal in the 200 meter race, he actually set the world record of 20 21.97 seconds, beating the world's best single amputees to the gold. From there onwards, his running career is just on the up. In 2005, Pistorius finishes sixth in the 400 meter South African Championships, setting another world record time. And the South African Championships was not for disabled athletes. He was running against fully abled people and he still came sixth. 
At the 2006 International Paralympic Committee's Athletic World Championships, try saying that five times fast, he wins gold in the 100 meter, 200 meter and 400 meter events. There's no denying that he was the best at what he did. And in fact, he was so good that he was now on level with some of the world's best non-disabled athletes. And he was actually on track at this point to win a place in South Africa's Olympic team, not Paralympic team, Olympic team. And um, ultimately, at this time in his life, he wasn't selected by the committee, but he was a consideration. Now, there was a lot of controversy over the prospect of Pistorius running alongside able-bodied athletes, because many of these people were claiming that Pistorius actually had an advantage over runners with natural ankles and natural feet. Now, I'm not going to dwell loads on this because the video is not about this, it's about the murder. Um, but I think it's important to just briefly talk about all this history. But the argument basically was that his cheetahs, his J-shaped running blades, actually propelled him forward with their springs, unlike regular feet. They were designed in every single way to make him an incredible runner, and able-bodied athletes only had what they were born with, and their skill. The argument basically was that Pistorius was at an advantage because he had these feet that just literally did the job for him, they pushed him forward, they're on springs, of course he was going to be able to run really, really fast. But at the same time, it's not all just about these blades. He had to have a huge amount of upper body strength and power in his thighs to be able to even propel himself forward in the first place. He'd had to overcome adversity, which was hard for most people to even imagine. And it's not that he was better than all these able-bodied athletes. He wasn't beating them. He was just kind of on par with them. He wasn't winning any races. He was usually coming sixth, seventh, eighth but people still weren't happy about the fact that he was in these races. It's a very nuanced argument, but basically in March 2007, the IAAF, which stands for the International Association of Athletics Federations, amended its competition rule to include a ban on the use of any technical device that incorporates springs, wheels, or any other element that provides a user with an advantage over an athlete not using such a device. They said this wasn't aimed at Pistorius, but at the end of the day, it kind of was. It stopped him being able to run in any IAF competitions against able-bodied runners. And this frustrated Pistorius because he was the best at what he did. He was one of the best Paralympic runners in the world. He swept up, he won gold at absolutely everything. So he kind of began to think, what's the point? What am I aiming towards here? He was like, I'm already the best in the world. I want to push myself. He wanted to be able to run against able-bodied people and he wanted to be able to prove himself. So he fought back and there was actually a couple of days where the IAAF monitored Pistorius's track performances to decide whether or not he was running at an unfair advantage. And basically in the end they concluded that he did have an unfair advantage and so it was ruled that his prosthetics were ineligible for use at any competition under the IAAF rules, which I'm pretty sure did include the Olympics. But he appealed and by May 2008, the decision was revoked with immediate effect and he was once again allowed to compete. But sadly, he still didn't get into the 2008 Olympics. It was too late. But it was announced in July 2012 that he'd been included in the Olympic team for the 400 meter race and the four times 400 meter relays. He didn't actually technically qualify to be a part of this team, but the South African committee chose to put him on the team, kind of to make a political statement more than anything else. And it worked. He became the first ever amputee runner to compete at the Olympic Games. He didn't exactly do amazing. He came eighth in the semi-final for the 400 meter race, and his team came eighth out of nine in the relay. But he was chosen to carry the South African flag for the closing ceremony. And then he goes to the Paralympics where he's back on top once again. He wins the gold as the anchor leg in the four times 100 meter relay, and he wins the gold in the 400 meter race as well but he actually ends up winning silver in the 200 meter. And he was furious about this. As soon as he left the track, he started to complain and he complained in front of pretty much the entire world about the length of the winner's blades. The winner was Brazilian Alan Oliveira. Pistorius went on record and said that he thought Alan's blades were too long for his body, giving him an unfair advantage. It was later concluded by the committee that actually Alan's blades were perfectly fine. He won fair and square. Pistorius was just having a bit of a tantrum about it. And Pistorius did later apologise, not for his comment, but for the timing of his comment. He said he stood by what he said, he just wished he'd said it at a better time. 
For a while, Oscar Pistorius was one of the biggest stars in Africa. He was awarded by the president for outstanding achievements in sport, and he was awarded the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Helen Rowlison Award, which is basically given to people for outstanding courage and achievement in the face of adversity. He first made the Time 100 annual list of the world's most influential people in 2008, and he appears back on the list even higher this time in 2012. He's offered sponsorship deals left, right and centre. He has flown out to the USA where he does all of the talk shows and although he didn't win the Olympics everyone was talking about him and put him and South Africa on the map and the committee knew this was going to happen when they chose him for the team but friends said they noticed a stark difference in Oscar once he came back from this kind of tour of all the talk shows they said he became arrogant he became a bit of a show-off this previously humble man the person they knew as their friend would now outright say to their faces that he thought he was better than them he thought that because he had this money he had this fame that he was just a better kind of human it was a world away from the man that his mother had raised him to be she had told him he could do anything and he had gone out and done anything but he'd gone too far off the other end. He would party all day and all night living off of energy drinks and he would exclusively date blonde models. He would slack off at his training, he kind of stopped even caring about being a runner at this point and he would be really rude to his trainer like when his trainer would tell him off for being late he would basically turn around and be like I pay you to be here, I give you a job, you need to listen to me, if I want to be late I'm allowed to be late and he just kind of began to think the entire world revolved around him. Kind of the beginning of the end for Pistorius. Now something else I want to mention that I couldn't really find anywhere else to naturally slip in was in February 2009, Pistorius was actually in a boating accident. He'd been in the Val River with some friends on a Saturday, meeting up with more friends and family on the river. And at one point he decides to drive the boat back to shore. Now he insisted that he hadn't been out on the river drinking, but somehow he ends up plowing the boat into a pier on the shore and Pistorius is thrown headfirst into the steering wheel and he ends up with pretty serious head and face injury. In his own words, his face was smashed in and he ends up in the ICU for several days in an induced coma. He ends up having to have surgery on his face to fix the wounds and he has over 180 stitches. The surgeon said that he was really lucky to avoid a serious brain injury. And a lot of people say that it was after this point that Oscar really began to change. He became very arrogant after he got all the fame, but it's really after this point in 2009 that they started to notice little changes in his personality. He couldn't hold down a long-term relationship. Many of his girlfriends started to report serious anger issues. He had a short temper and he was just changed as a person. It may have been the knock to the head that did it, or it may have just been the trauma of having such a serious accident, such a serious injury. Or maybe he was just a bit of a dick all along. I debated whether it was worth sharing so much of his backstory. It seems odd to celebrate all his achievements when he would go on to do what he would go on to do. But I think it's important to bear in mind that this is the kind of person that he was. This was his background. He was a very, very successful person. And that's why this is such a huge, unforgettable case. Pistorius had girls throwing themselves at him left, right and centre. He was never short of a model on his arm. He dated models and stars. His love life was always spread across all of the tabloids front page. And so it wasn't particularly shocking to anyone when 26 year old Pistorius is photographed on the red carpet, arm in arm with 30 year old model Reva Steenkamp. He'd been pictured on a boat just two weeks earlier with his 19 year old girlfriend, Samantha Taylor. So all the tabloids start their gossip. Oscar and Reva had met just earlier that day for the first time and they were kind of set up by a mutual friend who suggested that Oscar take Reva to be his plus one at a South African sports award event that evening. Oscar asked her, he said he didn't expect Reva to say yes, but she did and their relationship began in that moment. It seems their relationship became immediately intense. They went out for a coffee the next day and then they meet each other every day until eight days later, Reva flies off to Jamaica to film a castaway style reality TV show, which is called Tropica Island of Treasure. Um, it would later be screened after her death, just days after her death in a tribute to her. When Reva returns from filming this show, she picks up her relationship with Pistorius exactly where it left off. 
and she begins to do a series of very cryptic tweets and it seems like she was very happy in her new relationship. She was besotted even. One tweet she did read, they said, Reba baby use your head, but I choose to use my heart instead, which comes from song lyrics. Um, another tweet is, love comes from finding someone who makes you feel comfortable with yourself almost like finding the other part of yourself. So there's no denying in the early day of their relationship, Reva did seem genuinely happy. The two of them met in the November and by the January Pistorius was actually looking at buying a home in Johannesburg to be closer to Reva's home. Um, he introduced her to his neighbours as his fiance and the two seemed to be a really perfect fit for each other. They came from very similar backgrounds and upbringings, they both had to fight really hard to get to where they were now for their careers to be successful. They understood each other's preoccupations with health and diet, they shared a love for cars and a deep, deep Christian faith. They both had a love for horses and Reba had had an accident in her early 20s where she had fallen off a horse and broken her back. She had to completely learn how to walk again. She spent a lot of time in rehab and because of this, Oscar felt like she could relate to him and his struggles as an amputee. From the outside, they seemed like the perfect couple and there was no doubt to anyone, especially the tabloids, that they were deeply, deeply in love. So let's talk a little bit about Reva. So Reva Steenkamp was born on the 19th of August, 1983 in Cape Town, South Africa. Her father was South African, her mother was actually from Blackburn in England and so Reva had a dual citizenship. Her family later moved to Port Elizabeth where she would go on to study at the University of Port Elizabeth graduating with a Bachelor of Laws degree in 2005. And Reva would go on to work as a paralegal, but there was no denying that she was just absolutely beautiful. She'd been modeling on the side since she was 14 years old, and she continues doing this throughout her work as a paralegal. And the more modeling she does, the more she gets noticed. In 2011 and 2012, she was ranked number 40 and 45 in FHM's top 100 sexiest women in the world, South Africa. She applied to the bar in late 2011, hoping that by the age of 30, she'd be a qualified lawyer. She had beauty and brains, and she wanted to help people through her work in law. In 2012, she becomes the celebrity face of Spirit Day's anti-bullying campaign. And I know it's the standard to talk about somebody after their death, like they're the best person in the entire world. You only say good things about the dead, but I don't think I can stress enough here just how much of a good person Reva Steenkamp seemed to be. She was incredibly close to her parents, her mother was her best friend and she financially supported them and she intended to do so for the rest of her life. She enjoyed the limelight while she had it, she enjoyed modelling but she knew that this wasn't going to last forever. Being a lawyer was her long term goal and she was really conscious of planning a future for herself as she intended to use her skills in law to help out the less fortunate. She supported multiple campaigns against domestic violence against women, having previously been in an emotionally abusive relationship herself and having grown up seeing her mother in abusive relationships. From that day on, she dreamed one day opening a shelter to help women and children who had been affected by domestic violence. On just the day before her death, she tweeted urging followers to wear black the day after Valentine's Day in protest of violence against women. Had she lived the day after her death, she had plans to go and deliver a speech to a group of teenage girls, urging them not to give in to emotional abuse. Now, domestic violence is a problem across the entire world, but in South Africa, it was and it still is particularly bad. Um, it's difficult to gather actual statistics, actual numbers around the violence in South Africa because domestic violence is rarely reported. People just see it as the norm. But I did read a worrying study from 2013 that showed 50% of women surveyed reported suffering emotional and verbal abuse in the household. Um, in 1999, almost half of the female murders in South Africa resulted from domestic violence. 59% of women reported experienced domestic violence at least once in their lifetime. These numbers are absolutely shocking and this is what Reva dedicated her life to fighting. And then Oscar Pistorius comes along. Like I said, they seem to be a great couple, completely in love, barely apart. But you never know what goes on in a relationship behind closed doors. You never understand a relationship until you're in it. 
Reva had had concerns about this relationship. She didn't want to simply become known as Oscar's girlfriend as all of the previous girls had been known. She wanted to support herself, not depend on her famous boyfriend to get her everywhere in life. She wanted to pay her own mortgage, pay her own bills, buy her own things. Um, in the January, Pistorius was reportedly looking to buy a home in Johannesburg, like I mentioned for the two of them, and she actually texts him. She says, I'm just very set on maintaining my own independence and concentrating on my career this year and giving you your space to train and be the best you can be. Please don't see this as a sign of me distancing myself. It's respect for us as individuals. So to me this reads as like Oscar's being very very needy, he wants to move close to her, he wants to move in together and Reva's just a bit like listen we need our own space, we need to be individual people, we can't just be Oscar and Reva, we need to be separate individuals and they were happy in a couple but Reva really seemed to have her head screwed on here. At the time of her death Reva wasn't living with Oscar, she was living in Johannesburg with her best friend Gina Myers, Gina's sister Kim and Gina's parents, Cecil and Desi. Around 10 p.m. on the 13th of February, she sends Cecil and Desi a text. She says, hi guys, I'm too tired, it's too far to drive. I'm sleeping Oscars tonight, I'll see you tomorrow. And they did see her tomorrow, only to identify her body. Oscar lived in Pretoria, which was about an hour's drive from Johannesburg. Now, nobody can be entirely sure what happened that night in Oscar's home, but we can be sure that Pistorius shot Reva three times that night through a bathroom door and killing her. According to Pistorius, he thought that she was an intruder in his bathroom. And the rest of this video is going to be analyzing whether or not he truly believed this. Did he think Reva was an intruder or did he kill her on purpose? And there's no doubt that he's the one that shot this gun and killed her. So this is kind of a murder versus manslaughter case, I guess. In the early hours of the 14th of February, police receive a call to say that there'd been a shooting at the home of Oscar Pistorius. When the police arrive, they find paramedics trying to revive Reva downstairs who had been shot and died at the scene. Now, Pistorius is pretty much immediately taken into police custody. He admitted straight out that he was the one who shot her. And the next day, on the 15th of February 2013, he is formally charged with murder. It was later decided by a judge that the entire trial could be broadcast live via audio and parts of the trial could be broadcast on TV. She outright named the opening and closing arguments could be shown on TV, as well as the testimony of consenting state witnesses, the judgment and the sentencing if applicable. I personally watched a lot of that trial. Now, as you can probably imagine, this case was huge in the media. One of the most revered South African athletes was now convicted of murder. It was a shock to everyone. His house was surrounded by media within hours. Nike almost immediately suspends their sponsorship of Pistorius and the rest of the brands soon follow. Now, at first, it seems that people believed his story. They believed that he'd mistakenly shot and killed his girlfriend, that he thought she was an intruder. It was just a terrible, terrible tragedy. Tragedy. South Africa has some of the highest violent crime rates in the world and many homeowners do carry guns with them just to feel safe in their own home. That's just the way it is in South Africa, something that being from the UK I'll never really be able to understand. So no one initially questioned the story when he said that he thought his girlfriend was an intruder and shot her. But as new details of the investigation was released, public opinion began to change. Neighbours reported to the media that they'd heard shouting and screaming coming from the house earlier in the night. They said that the police had been called to the house on multiple previous occasions because of domestic issues. The bail hearing officially commenced on the 19th of February, during which the defence and the prosecution could agree that Oscar Pistorius had fired a gun through the locked bathroom door four times, shooting Reva three times. The purpose of this bail hearing was basically to decide if he was safe enough to be let out on the streets pending his trial. At the conclusion of the four-day bail hearing, the judge decided that the state had not convinced him that Pistorius would be a flight risk and gave him a bail of one million rand, which was about 56,000 pounds. 
The court case was intended to start pretty soon after this, but on the 4th of June it's officially delayed and it doesn't end up happening until the next year. Once Pistorius has been released on bail, he simply goes back to his training, goes back to his running. Now by the end of March, the judge actually lifts the travel ban they placed on Pistorius, saying that he saw no reason why Pistorius couldn't be allowed to travel for competitions. At the bail hearing, Pistorius had also been banned from drinking alcohol and going to his home where the shooting occurred, but the judge also lifts both of those bans as well. On August 19th, he's formally indicted on charges of murder and the illegal possession of ammunition. It's noted at the indictment that even if Pistorius was mistaken in the identity of the person he shot, as he insisted, his intention was still to kill. It was murder either way. The court case eventually began on the 3rd of March 2014, where Pistorius pleaded not guilty to one charge of murder and a firearms charge associated with the murder, as well as two unrelated gun indictments. He pleads not guilty to everything. The trial was assigned to a judge, Masipa, who personally allocated two assessors to help her evaluate the case and eventually come to a verdict. South Africa do not have a jury system in their courts since it was abolished during apartheid. Everything is to be decided by the judge. Now, before I get into the whole defence versus prosecution of it all, I'm going to tell you Pistorius's version of events. This is what, according to him, happened that night. He says that that night, Reva cooked and the two of them ate around 7pm before going to bed between 9 and 10pm. She goes to bed happy, she packs away all of her clothes in a bag before she goes to sleep and places the bag at the end of the bed. He says that in the middle of the night he woke up and he sort of just puts his hands over his face and like rubs his face as you kind of do when you wake up and he gets out of bed, swinging his legs out to the side. He said that he walked over to the other side of the room, Reva's side of the bed, and goes to the balcony, bringing in two fans and placing them at the end of the bed, facing towards the bed. Nor at any point during this does he realise that Reva's no longer in bed with him. As he's positioning these fans at the end of the bed, he hears a noise from the bathroom and he freezes in fear. He's feeling particularly vulnerable at this point because he hasn't got his prosthetic legs on, he's just on his stumps. Nor at any point does he assume that Reva's the one in the bathroom, nor does he reach to put on his prosthetic legs that were within arm's distance at this point. He makes his way to the bathroom, sitting on his stumps, calling to Reva to call the police. But he said he didn't question it when she didn't reply because it would make sense to him that she would want to stay as quiet as she could. He said he approached the bathroom and shot four times without even thinking and then returns to the bedroom, surprised that Reva isn't in there. He looks for her behind the curtains, he quickly looks for her around the room and only then does it click with him that she may have been the one in the bathroom. He puts on his pathetic legs and cries out for Reva. He said he tried to kick the bathroom door down, but it didn't work, so he runs and grabs a cricket bat and instead hits the door down with this bat. Eventually, he's able to see Reva lying on the floor, bleeding. Now, he doesn't immediately call for medical help, he doesn't call the police. The first thing he does is actually call a friend for help. He then picks Reva up off the bathroom floor and carries her through the bedroom and down the stairs, leaving a trail of blood behind him as he does so. When the doctor arrives, he finds them downstairs and the first thing Pistorius said to the doctor was, I shot her. I thought she was a burglar, I shot her. And according to the doctor, he was there praying that she lived. That's Pistorius's version of events for that night. The prosecution's job was to prove that Pistorius knew it was Reva in the bathroom and not a burglar, therefore proving the difference between murder and culpable murder, as it was called in this case. By the time the doctor arrived, Reva had no pulse and she was not breathing. The doctor said it was very obvious already that she was dead. She'd been shot three times, once on the hip area, once on the right arm, and once in the right side of the head, the bullet going into her brain. There there was discoloration on the skin around the bullet wound, consistent with bullets that had been fired through a wooden object, in this case a door. Each one of the three gun wounds, the doctor said, would have been fatal in isolation due to the extent of the bleeding. There was so much blood that she lost. 
and Reba's right arm was broken and she had multiple skull fractures. Had she lived, she likely would never have been able to use her right arm again. The exact order in which the bullets hit Reva has never been agreed upon by both sides, but it seems most likely that she was first hit in the hip and then as she fell, she was hit in the arm and then in the head. The bullets were all fired in very quick succession. One of the prosecution's main points was the food found in Reva's stomach. Now, Pistoria said that the last time they ate was chicken and vegetables around 7 p.m. But vegetable matter found in Reva's stomach suggested that she'd eaten only a couple of hours before death. And this would have been the early hours of the morning, probably around 1 a.m. She was unlikely to have gone downstairs in the middle of the night while Pistorius was sleeping and just eaten something in the kitchen because she would have had to have turned all the lights on, made a noise, unlocked the bedroom door and deactivated the downstairs alarm, which Pistorius probably would have heard her doing. The defence argued that the science of analysing the contents of a stomach was highly controversial and an inexact science. And they also said that the stomach may have just been digesting the food slower, as can be caused by alcohol whole drugs, prescription medication, or just Reva's genetics. The reason that this food is so important is because Oscar said the two of them went to bed shortly after they ate, between 9 and 10 p.m., meaning that there wouldn't have been any arguing between the two in the night. The prosecution's entire case depended on the fact that the two of them had an explosive argument throughout the night around midnight, 1 a.m., as heard by a neighbour. And therefore, they didn't go to bed at 9 to 10 p.m., they were awake all night, and therefore, Reva may have eaten later. A neighbour named Estelle said she heard arguments late into the night and it was so loud that actually woke her up around 1.56am and from there it lasted at least an hour. She later heard four banging sounds. However, other neighbours who lived closer to the house said they heard nothing at all. According to Pistorius, in the entire time he was awake, walking out to the balcony, bringing the fans in, placing them at the end of the bed, he didn't notice at any point that Reva was gone. He said it was too dark to notice. He says that when he woke up, he apparently saw her legs wrapped up in the duvet. And she must have silently slipped to his side of the bed and out of the room whilst he was dragging in the fans from the balcony. The defence said that it would just have been simply too dark for him to see her go to the bathroom and he was preoccupied by the sound of the fans being dragged in and therefore he didn't hear her either. But the prosecution's argument here is, if he heard somebody in the bathroom, why would he not assume it's Reva? Why would his mind immediately go to it being an intruder? Why would he not check that she was in the bed? At the end of the day, he was stood right at the end of the bed and she would have been just there. And at any point did he try to look and see if she was there? It just seems a little bit unusual. Pistorius said that part of the reason that he shot at the door was because he felt vulnerable with his disability. He was quicker to react to the situation than other able-bodied people would have been. His aim, he said, was to protect Reva. But not at any point did he take the second to put on the prosthetic legs that were within arm's reach of him at the time. According to his version of events, he only put the legs on once he returned to the room after shooting at the door. When he knocks down the door with a cricket bat, at that point he is wearing his prosthetic legs. But the prosecution argued that the marks on the door actually suggest that he was on his stumps at the time he was trying to kick it down. The marks are at a lower height than they would have been if he was trying to kick it with his prosthetic legs. The defence asked him to remove his legs in court and stand on his stumps, which proved that he was very very off balance whilst he was on his stumps and therefore he wouldn't have had the balance to be able to kick the door down. The prosecution argued that there was no way that Oscar didn't know that Reva was in the bathroom at the time, especially after he fired the first shot. It's hard to believe that after being shot she wouldn't make any kind of noise. She was most likely shot in the leg first and then would have likely screamed as she fell down to the ground. There were four bullets but apparently she didn't make any noise as she was being shot. The defence said that all the shots were fired in such quick succession that she wouldn't have had time to scream and even if she did scream, stories probably wouldn't have heard her because of the noise of the gun. But still, I do find this very hard to believe that even if maybe she did make a noise and it would have already been too late and she would have died regardless, she would have made some noise as she fell to that ground and Pistorius didn't immediately knock the door down, he went to look for her. And you usually can tell the difference between a female scream and a male scream. Pistorius was well known to be a gun nut. He kept one in his bedroom at all times and he was often seen at shooting ranges in the area. 
People said that if he couldn't sleep, he would be seen at the shooting ranges at three, four in the morning. South Africa itself is a nation obsessed with guns. It's ingrained in the culture, and that is something I will never be able to understand coming from England. But it was revealed in court that just a few days before Reva's death, Pistorius had spent £2,700 on seven separate firearms. And shortly after Reva's death, he cancelled this order, knowing how bad it looked. As part of the sales agreement for buying these guns, he had to fill out a questionnaire. And this questionnaire showed that he knew that it was unacceptable to shoot men breaking into your home, unless you could see that they were armed and an immediate danger. So even if he did believe the intruder was in his bathroom, he still acted rashly and beyond the law. If there was an intruder in there, he couldn't see the intruder, he didn't know the intruder had a gun, and therefore he didn't know that he was in immediate danger. About a month before the shooting, Pistorius fired a gun inside a crowded restaurant and asked a friend to take the blame because of the media hype that would surround him if he didn't. An ex-girlfriend also reported him firing his gun through the sunroof of his car whilst he was driving, both of which he was also facing charges for in this court. The prosecution used these incidents to illustrate a pattern of reckless behaviour. The bullets that Pistorius used that night are also very interesting. They weren't standard bullets, they were black talon bullets. Bullets designed to mushroom on contact with a body and maximise the damage that it can cause on a person. Pistorius bought these bullets not just intending to possibly injure an intruder into his home, he bought these bullets to murder. There's no doubt that once you're shot with these bullets, they cause maximum damage. They have a spinning motion, they cut a bigger wound inside your body, inside the human it hits, and then it just explodes. It breaks down, attacking everything in its path. These bullets won't exit the body because of the mushroom shape they turn into. They will kill you. So when Oscar shot these bullets, he wasn't aiming to injure someone. He was aiming to kill. And if you know this case at all, you've probably been waiting for me to mention this last prosecution point, the texts. There were texts between Reva and Pistorius that painted a picture of very turbulent, unhappy relationship between the two before she died. The media painted them as South Africa's Brad and Angelina, but that couldn't be further from the truth. In the weeks before her death, she tells him that she's falling in love with him, but she writes, dating you comes with sick people trying to fill my head with doubt, and I'm learning to trust what is real and safe. Oscar sent Reva a text saying, you're making me so happy and I know we argue from time to time, but I think we're actually so similar. It's normal for couples to argue, of course, and at first it just seems like they're arguing and trying to work through their differences. But later on, she complains of his jealousy and his apparent tantrums. She says, I'm scared of you sometimes and how you snap at me. It seems like he would criticise her for absolutely everything. He would tell her off if she didn't act in public how he wanted her to act. He would get jealous when she would speak to other men. He accused her of rushing him away from people. She would message him back saying that she felt like she was being picked on and attacked by the one person that she felt should protect her. She says that she's trying her best to make him happy but he doesn't treat her like a lady. She has to defend herself when he accuses her of being promiscuous. She says that yes, she has a past but she's never been a stripper or a hoe. Everyone has a past and he seems to be holding these past relationships against her. So yes, couples do argue, but Pistorius's text to Reva read as jealous and controlling. Reva's trying to defend herself when she's done nothing wrong. It's really sad that Reva spent a huge amount of her life fighting against emotional abuse in relationships, but she found herself trapped in that kind of relationship once again. It's easy to see in hindsight or from the outside, but when you're in that kind of relationship, it's hard to read the signs, even if you are well educated in something like that, and it's even harder to escape. And that's the kind of situation that it seems Reva found herself in. These texts, WhatsApp messages were a huge part of the prosecution's case. But I just want to touch on a few other of the defence's final points as well before I round up on this part of the video. Um, so the defence at one point used his anxiety as an excuse for his actions, saying that it affected how he responded to perceived threats. His childhood and the amputation of his legs contributed to these very anxious feelings. He always felt vulnerable and he was terrified of death 
after his boating accident. On cross-examination, the chief prosecutor asked the psychiatrist if someone with Pistorius's anxiety condition and access to guns would be a danger to society. The psychiatrist answered yes. Personally, I have a lot to say on this particular topic. I could write an entire essay about it as someone who was diagnosed with generalised anxiety disorder when I was just three years old and a whole host of other anxiety disorders throughout my life. When you have anxiety, everything is scarier than it is for a regular person, for somebody who doesn't have anxiety. It's impossible to explain the feeling to someone who's never felt it before. For me, everything feels like a threat. Everything feels like it's the end of the world. I can relate to that feeling of fear and I always describe my anxiety as just the complete lack of logic. Personally, I'd say in general, I'm a very logical person, but when I'm in that moment, when something happens that triggers my anxiety, logic just flies out of the window. I have none. I cannot rationalize a thing when I'm having an anxiety episode, but, I have never killed anyone or harmed anyone in any way whatsoever because of this. Because despite this escalated feeling of fear, you still know the law. You know that it's bad to kill someone. Even if I had access to a gun in the middle of an anxious episode, my first thought wouldn't be to shoot a person. Yes, anxiety can cause you to act irrationally at times, but I feel like it's a cop-out to say that he killed Reba because of anxiety. It's kind of offensive. Following the evidence given about his anxiety, the judge rules that Pistorius must undergo a mental health examination and these examinations continue over the next month. And these examinations find that no, he was not mentally incapacitated when he shot Reva. His general emotional state whilst he was in the stand was also concerning. He could not keep himself together. He was crying constantly, and I'm not talking just tears, I'm talking about sobbing in the stands, and he even threw up on occasion. There's a lot more evidence I could give for both sides of the argument here, defence and prosecution, but that can make this video incredibly long, so I've chosen what I perceive to be the most important parts of the case, most important parts of the argument, on both sides. If you do want to get into real nitty gritty details of this case, all my sources will be linked down below. I've condensed a six month court case into a single video here, so if I haven't mentioned something that you deem important, then just stick it in the comments down below. The trial eventually comes to a close, and on the 12th of September 2014, the formal verdict is delivered. The judge had already dismissed most of the prosecution's evidence, which she described as circumstantial, and described Pistorius himself as a very poor witness. Judge Masipa said that the state had not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Pistorius was guilty of premeditated murder. However, she said the couple homicide was a competent verdict, basically what in the UK we'd have as manslaughter. She said that any reasonable person would have foreseen the possibility that if he fired four shots, whoever was behind the toilet door might be struck and die as a result. She said that he acted too hastily and that he used excessive force. He was found not guilty of murder, but found guilty of culpable homicide and guilty of reckless endangerment with a firearm at a restaurant. He was found not guilty of charges of discharging a firearm through the sunroof of a car and illegal possession of ammunition. Court was adjourned until the October for the sentencing and Pistorius was granted a bail extension for this time. And then on the 21st of October, 2014, Pistorius receives a prison sentence of a maximum of just five years for culpable homicide. Part of the sentence may be served under correctional supervision after he has served a minimum of one-sixth of five years, which is just 10 months in prison. He also received a prison sentence of three years for reckless endangerment, which was to be suspended for five years. So he goes to prison for what is going to be just 10 months, and the prosecution immediately begins appeals. By June 2015, a parole board is set to recommend that Pistorius is released from prison and transferred to house arrest in the August. Um, but the Justice and Correctional Services Minister says that it's just a little bit too early to release him just yet. And he's eventually released in October 2015 and placed under house arrest then. So he spent just a year in prison for being put on house arrest back in the comfort of his uncle's home. But then in the December, thanks to relentless appeals from the prosecution, the culpable homicide conviction is overturned and it is changed to murder. 
Judge Eric Leach ruled that Pistorius should have foreseen that firing a gun would result in the death of whoever was behind that door. Regardless of whether it was Reva or an intruder, he knew that shooting this gun was going to kill someone. But despite this, just days later, he's actually granted bail and he's allowed to leave his uncle's home. And he's allowed to travel up to 20 kilometers between the hours of 7 a.m. and 12 p.m. Although now they've said that he should be charged with murder. He's just being given more freedom. He's eventually resentenced on the 6th of July, 2016. The same judge, Judge Masipa, is the one who ends up resentencing him to a further six years in prison for murder. Although the prosecution did call for 15 years, which is the minimum for murder in South Africa. Masipa argued that Pistorius had already served 12 months in prison for the culpable homicide conviction and that he was remorseful for his killing. There's no doubt that his position as a celebrity very much helped him out when it came to this sentencing. And there were rumours going around that he was paying off law enforcement, but honestly I couldn't find anything to actually confirm that. Um, in November 2017, the South African Supreme Court of Appeal added nine years to this six year sentence. So it's now a total of 15 years, finally. Pistorius is now in jail and he will be eligible for parole in 2023 and his defence team are appealing this new ruling. So now, years later, he is in jail for the murder of Reva Steenkamp after a very long, very lengthy trial. There's no doubt that his celebrity status played a lot into this. He was hailed as a South African hero who just had this all fall, fall from grace. I cannot wait to hear your guys' opinions on this. Do you think he did know it was Reva? I personally think he did know it was her. I think the two were having big arguments long into the night. He was very jealous, very controlling. She probably had enough. She locked herself in the bathroom, maybe to get away from him, maybe just go to the loo, and he loses control and he shoots her. Maybe he meant to just scare her, but he murdered her. I know I did miss out parts of the trial, maybe information that other people may deem important, so if there are any things that you think would be interesting to people hearing this, then put them in the comments down below. I don't find it offensive for people add extra information down below, I think it's really helpful as long as you're like polite about it. Thank you so much for watching, let me know what videos you want to see from me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys!